Well, amen. Just seemed like the right thing to start with. And let me say what a, a joy it is to be here. Pastor Jim, thank you for uh, allowing me to come. And I'm uh, grateful all of you are here. Uh, I love Jim and Stephanie. I just love the Purdue's. And uh, they have been great friends and real encouragers in our life. And uh, grateful for the Taylors and uh, your neighbors here fixed dinner. So I uh, came early and I'll do that. I'll come early for a free meal. And uh, so thank you very much. And uh, Michael Kasner, one of my laymen that offered to drive me down. And uh, I appreciate that so much. And the music was wonderful everywhere they went. Uh, out here, I guess it was. I uh, normally like to use as big a words as I can and be as impressive as I can when I speak away. And so uh, I want to use a big word to say appreciation for the music. I thought the music was hippopotamusly wonderful. So it was, uh, it was good. I uh, leave my house. I finally got a house. I've been homeless for about two or three months. I decided to sell my house. So I'm, excuse me, so get it right. My wife decided to sell our house. And uh, after we had remodeled it, I mean, we had remodeled every room and got it just like we wanted. And then she said, I want to sell it. And so uh, I've made my mind up a long time ago, you can either be right or happy. And so I'm, I'm happy. So I said, sure, we'll sell it. So we sold it in an hour. And um, and they wanted it right away. So I'm living in my daughter's basement. The bad thing is my daughter is just like my wife. And I can never win an argument. Honest the goodness. I mean, just with two women there. So, uh, But we have bought a house. So we're in the process of moving. But when I leave home, I do what a lot of you do. I put in my four-digit code and then simply put away. And you know the, what happens. The sensors are on. And uh, you touch a door or window in that house, it's an awful sound. But one I've not used, my wife likes to use, is you can put in a four-digit code and put stay, and it throws on extra sensors, actually infrared lights that scan your floors, and it just even becomes more sensitive. So it's our alarm system. Did you know that the Bible teaches that God placed in the human soul a divine alarm system? It's called the conscience. And so I want to speak to you tonight on the conscience. And so I hope you'll follow along. In a few moments, I'm going to walk you through five biblical statements. And it's certainly not exhaustive, but five biblical statements on the conscience. So if you've got a pencil, pen, lipstick, or mascara, I would encourage you to make notes. And you're going to wonder, what did he say about the conscience? Um, Last thing I want to do is be controversial, but I would like to be uh, as culturally true as I can be. This literally does happen periodically. A grandmother or a mom may come to see me and say, I want you to help me with uh, my children or my grandchildren. And they'll tell me a story like this. Uh, my daughter was very active in church. Uh, she went off on mission trips, used to sing in the choir, periodically brought friends to church and even saw some of her friends converted. But when she went off to college, she began to stray away, and we noticed it. And she called us the other day to tell us that she's going to marry her girlfriend. And so the questions often asked, Pastor, how did they get there? How, how do you go from here to there? Well, I just want to weigh in on it biblically. I think it's the conscience. And so I want you to see what the Bible says about the conscience. Almost everywhere I preach in America, people say, I've never heard a message on the conscience. So the conscience, let's define it first of all with Webster. It's an awareness of right and wrong with a compulsion to do right. So I want you to listen to this. And I'm going to show you that it's the same thing in the Greek New Testament. Not only did God give every person here in their conscience the capacity to know right from wrong, he actually gives you a nudge in the right direction. So I'm telling you, for you to go against God, you're not just going against what you know is right or wrong. He's nudging you to go in the right direction. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words tells us that the conscience is a compound word with the preposition with to know. It's a co-knowledge with oneself. It's the witness born to one's conduct by the conscience. 
So it's that faculty by which we apprehend the will of God and that which is designed to govern our lives. Now, occasionally somebody says, just let the conscience be your guide. That is biblically incorrect. And so you've got to watch it. There's some well-worn proverbs that are not biblical. You need to test them against the word of God. But it is not to be our guide. But let me tell you what it is. It's a goad and a governor. You may say, what do you mean? When the apostle Paul was under conviction in Acts chapter 9, when he was Saul of Tarsus, uh, the Bible says that Jesus spoke from heaven, called him by name, and just for the record's sake, listen carefully, Jesus knows you by name. All right? I'm saying all of you, all of us. And the Bible says he said, Saul, Saul, uh, why do you persecute me? And why do you kick against the pricks? And he uses that word for goad. Goad is the terminology of a farmer. It would be a long wooden handle with a metal tip on the end. He would use it with his oxen. He would goad the ox to get him to move. How many of you know that God goads us with the Holy Spirit and with the Word of God and speaks to us? And people told me one time, they said, we came to hear you. We're not coming back to your church. And I thought, well, I hate to hear that. I wish you'd come. They said, no. Sometimes when we leave your church, we don't feel good about ourselves. And I said, so what are you looking for? And here's what they said. They said, well, we found another church, and every time we go, we feel good. I said, I wouldn't recommend that church. I said, why? I said, because you're not that good. There is nobody so good that you can leave church after hearing the word of God and never feel any conviction. Or sometimes somebody said, it makes me feel guilty. Have you ever thought that it's not the preacher making you feel guilty? It's the Holy Spirit of God using the gospel and the word of God to goad and prick your heart. Matter of fact, if it was not for the Holy Spirit goading your heart, you'd go to hell and never have any mindset of the need to respond to Christ. So I thank God for his goad. It's a governor. It's a governor in that it's the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit that keeps us from doing some things we shouldn't do. There's so much talk about how salvation is sovereign. And boy, I'm there, certainly. Salvation's of the Lord. It's a sovereign work of God. You can't save yourself. But I want to go a step further. Not only is salvation sovereign, sanctification is sovereign. I believe God has supernaturally intervened in my life with a restraining influence of the Spirit of God and kept me from doing things that would have embarrassed me and my family. Anybody else here want to say amen? <laughs> And so the conscience, and this is one of my favorite statements, so listen carefully, and it's going to give you a window to the sermon. The conscience may be compared to a window that lets in the light. God's law, the Bible, is the light. And the cleaner the window, the more the light shines in. Uh, periodically, somebody says, we, we're visiting around, we, we don't get anything out of your sermons anymore. And I've got a Greek word for that, hogwash. I'm just going to be honest, um, I'm not a boring preacher. I'm not. Uh, you, you may be bored, but that's your problem. <laughs> and so the bottom line, somebody says, we're, we're, we're going to go somewhere else. Uh, we just don't get anything out of it. Could that really tell me more about you than about the preacher? So I'm not intimidated and insecure when somebody makes that statement. Because if the light can get through the window called the conscience, God can speak to you. And if it doesn't get through, it's because you've allowed your conscience to become dirty. And so the conscience is not an infallible guide, but it acts according to the light that it has. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 9.1. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So the conscience is a God-implanted knowledge of right and wrong within our heart. So let me give you several statements. First of all, let me talk about a good conscience. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, con the context is the Apostle Paul is standing before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. He's at Caesarea by the sea. And it's a large arena to this day. You can go there. There is an indentation where we know that the governor would have sat in that day and the king would have sat there. And it was actually called in the Greek, Bema, B-E-M-A, which means judgment seat. 
And people would come there to receive rewards. And if somebody was being tried, as Paul was being tried before Agrippa, Festus, and Felix, they would stand before them. And listen to what Paul said in Acts 24, 16. This being so, I myself also strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. Now, how important is that? Uh, Here's the uh, Apostle Paul. He's been converted from a uh, wicked lifestyle. He was a persecutor of the church. He consented to the death of the first New Testament martyr. So how, how can he stand now and preach with clarity and conviction and give us 13 books in the New Testament? Because his conscience had undoubtedly been acquitted him of his early days and past life. Aren't you, aren't you glad that by the blood of Jesus we can get past our past? I mean, how could I stand and preach against anything that I've ever been involved in in my past unless God acquits my conscience? And so he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm striving to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. Listen to Acts 23.1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God and to this day. Good conscience. Hebrews 13.18. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience. 1 Timothy 1 5, now the purpose of commandment is love from a pure heart and a good conscience. So God created us with a conscience as a self judging faculty. There's probably not a person in this room that has not observed the Lord's Supper. Have you ever been intrigued by 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul says to the church at Corinth as they take the Lord's Supper, he said, Judge yourself that you may not be judged of God. How under heaven do we judge ourselves? Our conscience. Our conscience will either accuse us or excuse us. Now, what I just said is biblical. Romans chapter 2, verse 15, says the conscience either accuses you or excuses you. Now, you've probably never done this, but my wife and I get in a spat every now and then. That's a Greek word for an argument. And so... um, so I leave the house. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ticked off, all right? And so I'm riding down the road, and the Holy Spirit begins to deal with me and basically says, you're not right. And after a moment, I uh, acquiesce, and I say, God, I'm sorry. I need you to forgive me. And then I take out my phone, and I call my sweet wife, and I say, hey, baby, uh, I just asked God to forgive me. I really didn't act right. I shouldn't have uh, been harsh. And I've asked God to forgive me, and I'd like for you to forgive me. And uh, she does, and then we sing two stanzas of what a friend we have in Jesus. And, uh, and we, we uh, move on. Now, uh, how, did, how did I know something was wrong? Are y'all listening? My conscience. That right and wrong, and wait a minute, and nudges you to do what's right. You have to be really resistant to the Spirit of God. He not, not only gives you a revelation of what's right, he pushes you in the right direction. And so we get it right. Now, I want to give you a verse, and honest uh, to goodness, this verse is um, powerful about the conscience. In 1 Timothy 1.19, the Bible describes what can happen to a man or a woman with a good conscience. Listen to this. Having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have, have suffered shipwreck. In other words, your life was really a picture of a ship sailing on a smooth sea. God began to speak into your conscience. You knew right from wrong, but you resisted. And you, wait a minute, you rejected the probing of Jesus Christ. Uh, you, you could even leave church and say, that's his interpretation. I, I know Hebrew and Greek. Hebrew, baloney. Baloney. You know God's speaking to you. But people do that every now and then. I didn't like that preacher's sermon. Why do you give the preacher credit for what God said? And and God really speaks in your life. And so they've suffered shipwreck. There's a really good chance that somebody's in this room tonight. And there was a time it was smooth sailing in your walk with Jesus. And it's not now. And and you've, you've had a good conscience. But your conscience was probed by Jesus. And what you did is resisted him and rejected him. And as a result, every time you pushed him away, you quenched him, you grieved him. And as a result, you've suffered shipwreck. So I wrote a little statement. Here it is. 
The good conscience serves as a rudder that steers the believer through the rocks and reefs of sin and error. No wonder Paul would say in 2 Timothy 1.3, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. So it's a good conscience. Number two, the Bible speaks of a weak conscience. Now let me explain this. 1 Corinthians 8.12. And listen to the language. I'm just lifting it out of the Bible. But when you thus sin against the brethren... And wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Now, first of all, listen to your Bible. When you sin against your brethren, you mean, wait a minute, you can sin against another person? That's what the Bible says. And when you do it, you're sinning against Christ. And it says, and you wound their weak conscience. So, so listen carefully. There's a call in the scripture to be sensitive to your conscience and to the conscience of others. Say, say, in particular, this context is the conscience of newer converts. Uh, we're still accusing them wrongly with regards to allowing them to eat idle food without feeling spiritually corrupt and guilty. So let me just explain it. Car rent. So I don't know if you've ever read and studied much about the history of the church of Corinth. Um, Corinth, when Paul got there, he stayed there 18 months. It was one wicked city. They had uh, temple prostitutes in their worship service. Um, they were just a godless crowd. And so when Paul goes in, I mean, God begins to change people. And, and let me tell you one of the things they do. Uh, they would offer sacrifices, but when they offered the sacrifice, they didn't always sacrifice all the meat. So what would they do with the leftover meat? They would take it and sell it at the meat market at a reduced rate. So these old boys were pagans. They just, uh, you know, on their way to Hades. And bottom line is... Um, they bought the meat because it was the cheaper, but then they started going to Paul's meetings and got saved. And when they got saved, here's what they said. I, I, I just, I don't want to have anything to do with that idol worship meeting. I, I, I'm not going to buy meat that was offered to an idol. And, and then there's, you know, the, the Pharisees in the church and the Pharisees say, oh, nothing wrong with buying it. They just need to grow up. When the Bible says you're offending those weaker believers. So let's let Paul answer it. So listen carefully. What did Paul say? The very next verse, 1 Corinthians 8, 13. Their food is, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I'll never eat meat again. Whatever happened in the Christian church to it first being about Jesus and second it being about others, when under heaven did it become so much meism? My liberty. I can do this. I don't care what they think. That is so foreign to the New Testament. And, and acting like Jesus. So Paul said, I, I'll just not eat it again. And so I, I want to live in such a way that I'm not a stumbling block. And, and so, so while I'm at it down here in, in middle Georgia, let me just say to you something. The reason I'm a teetotaler, and by the way, uh, don't, don't look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. I drank for years. I managed to bloom in pool room for four years. High school dropout, a teenage drunk. But I'm telling you, I hadn't, I hadn't touched a drop since I got saved. Your son will never... Drink alcohol because he saw me drink alcohol. I will not cause the weaker to stumble. Yeah, yeah. And some of us may say, well, I, I've got liberty. Yeah. yeah, you sure do, to do what you want to. And regardless of how Jesus feels or what it does to the body of Christ. No, that's all I'm going to say about that. I feel better. got that out there. Number three. So there's a weak conscience, there's a good conscience. Number three, there's a convicting conscience. Now listen to the words lifted off the Bible. <clears throat> John 8, 9, you'll know the story. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And by the way, that's where it ought to start. Men, ladies, it ought to be those of us that have been in the faith longer. We ought to be the first to get right. We ought to lead the way. And the Bible says, and Jesus was left alone and a woman standing in the midst. Aren't you know the story? The woman's been called in the act of adultery. I did research on this this summer and throughout the New Testament. On a regular basis, the disciples would be with Jesus. And these Pharisees would come, religious leaders, and they'd say, they would try to kind of tangle Jesus up. You know, like, hey, Jesus, uh, we know what the Bible says, but what do you say? And so what they did, they caught this woman in adultery. And they said, uh, we caught this lady in the very act. And I've got a question. If they caught her in the very act, would somebody tell me where the man is? And so they uh, looked at him and they said, uh, now we know what the law says. And the law says stoner. 
But what say you? You know, like we're going to find out that he doesn't follow the Bible. That's what we're going to find out. By the way, let me go ahead and throw this in theologically. Um, Jesus don't have to answer us. (laughs) Who do you think you are? You ever heard that crowd in your church? I'll tell you what, when I get to heaven, I got a question for God. Who you do? Wow. Can can you imagine us getting to heaven and everybody's bowing? I mean, Jim was having a spell over there in worship tonight. I can imagine what it's going to be like to be near him in heaven. He was just, he was getting after it and throwing on and all. And so when we get to heaven, can you imagine um, what we will notice in heaven? Let me just set those straight. Who sits on the throne in heaven? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is God. And let me tell you what I know about him. The Bible says that he will be uh, one you can see that will appear as one who has been slain from the foundation of the world. I believe all through eternity we will see the Lord Jesus Christ bear the marks of Calvary, which will remind you that you didn't get there because you were good. You got there because he was God, and he made an ultimate sacrifice for us, for our sins. But can't you imagine we're there and we're worshiping Jesus at the throne, and then there's a line of Baptists over there on the side. Who are they? They've got questions for God. So he didn't answer them. But the Bible says instead he knelt down in the sand and he began to write. And the question is, what did he write? Well, theologically, no one knows. Uh, one person told me, they said, I, I think he wrote the law. I, I think he's more personal than that. I think he probably just listed a first name like Johnny and named one of my secret sins. Y'all all right? And by the way, and when he did, the Bible says, starting with the oldest to the last, they dropped their rocks. This is a great thought. He said, let he that is without sin cast the first stone. You know what that means? He was the only one that qualified to throw one. And so I have a sanctified imagination. So here's what I thought. Jesus could have reached over and picked up Mount Hermon and Mount Nebo. And woof. You know, I mean, if he wanted to, but he didn't. And so the person he's dealing with with a convicting conscience is an individual that is quick to make judgment on other people, but has a very difficult time seeing sin in their own life. Matter of fact, normally the people that are the most brutal towards somebody else's sin normally has sin in their own heart. Pastor, why don't you give an explanation of that? Well, thank you for asking. You remember the story of David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and Nathan comes to him, and Nathan says, Hey, David, I want to tell you a story. And he says, Hey, there's a man here in town. He's got one little lamb. And he loves that lamb. He said he, he, he lets them sleep in the bed with him, you know, like you do your cats and dogs. And so um, he said, um, there's another man down the street. He, he's got hundreds, hundreds of, of lamb, and little sheep, and said, but you know what he did? He went up and took this man's and killed it, served it to his people. And the Bible says David was ticked off. I mean, it does. It just said he was full of, of wrath. And he said, ever who did that, they're going to pay. Isn't that amazing? How can he be that judgmental over somebody else's sin and so mean-spirited over somebody else's sin? And maybe it's an indication of his own sin. And then David was confronted by Nathan. He said, thou art the man. And, and we, what he was really talking about, it weren't lambs. He was talking about who? Bathsheba. And he brought it home to him. Number four, a defiled conscience. Uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 15 says that the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Listen to this, but their minds and conscience are defiled. So you need to listen. What if the Holy Spirit of God was to show you tonight that your conscience is defiled? And it's going to go a step further in just a moment, then I'll wrap it up. But it says they profess to know God. They say they're a Christian, but in works they deny him. They don't live like they know him. You know anybody like that? Now listen to the text again. They profess to know God. I'm a Christian, but in works, they deny him. In other words, there's no evidence in your life that they're a Christian. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Now the word corruption speaks of the conscience. It's possible to sow sin against the probing of the conscience until it becomes defiled. Now I I like to uh, use this word study in my office And I can look up a word and tell you how it's translated and where it's translated everywhere in the Bible. The word corruption is used in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 15, and it's translated die, D-Y-E. It's on a plane 
not long ago, and I had a pocket, and I had my pen, and I, I carry uh, inexpensive pens. I have a guy, and I, I always tell this story, and it's true, he's a jeweler, and he got right with God under my ministry, so he brings me high-end pens, and, and i rather he not do that because I, I lose them, and I feel awful when I lose them. Now, I either lose them or when I'm signing books, my church members take them. <laughs> and I was just kidding. Just want to see if you were listening. But uh, so I just carry this uniball. But what I've found is when I fly, sometimes the uh, pressure in the cabin and that altitude, Michael, he's a jet pilot, flows, flies me a lot of places through the years. I was on the plane and it, it bursted. It, that thing erupted. And uh, so I, I'm not aware of it. And the flight attendant comes down and said, oh my, and look. And big black dot, wet as all get out, just soaked. I pulled my pen out, and it was just dark black, and she took it, and we just threw it away. And I'm on my way to preach, and I don't have another shirt. And uh, she said, did you know that seltzer water will take that ink out? I said, man, really? So they went and got me a cloth and got me some seltzer water, and I started scrubbing, and sure enough, man, it started coming out. I was so happy. But what it did, it, it uh, made this whole side of my shirt gray. And so, and um, and by the way, that's what happens. Um, you can't manage or control sin; it spreads like that, and it affects the entire area. So that it it just died there. And now remember, if the conscience is likened into a window that lets the light in, and the light is God's law, and the cleaner the window, the easier the light can get in. What what do you think happens if you're conscience is corrupted if it's died and now the light can't get in well let me, let me give you the the four, fifth and final it's a seared conscience uh first timothy 4 2 the bible says speaking lies and hypocrisy having their own conscience seared with a hot iron the word seared is a medical term referring to cauterization it's the allowing of your conscience to be desensitized. So I wanted to look that word up again. I said, where is this word used that it means the most and the clearest to follow? So you ready? Ephesians 4.19, the Bible says that when we become uh, insensitive to Jesus, we become past feeling. In other words, there was a time you could go to church and God would speak to you and, and you'd find yourself responsive and and uh, moving toward him. But then you got where you're desensitized. It, not, it doesn't bother you anymore. Uh, somebody says, man, I wish they were there to hear that message. Well, I'm glad they're here, but they're, they're past feeling. It means to be morally insensitive. So now listen to me carefully. As you continue to sin and turn away from God, you become still more apathetic about moral and spiritual things. It speaks of losing of moral restraint. See, see, the Christian's hope and strength is in the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit. But repeated sinning hardens the conscience so that it becomes seared like scar tissue. And the neglected and resisted conscience becomes more insensitive, listen, and eventually may stop giving warning systems about wrongdoing. So, so really, a, a young person or, or a middle-aged person begins to say, I used to feel this way, but I, I don't feel that way anymore. I, I, I feel fine. I think God understands, and, and I'm okay with this, when it's directly opposed to everything Jesus teaches. But we begin to feel okay about it because in our conscience, it's become cauterized. The word that is used there is the word for calluses. You can take a pen, a sharp pen, and stick through my callus, and I can't feel a single thing. But go a little deeper. Very sensitive. You know what's happened? It's possible that someone's allowed their heart to become calloused. The music doesn't get through to you anymore. Um, the preaching don't get through. Matter of fact, it doesn't even really bother if you don't come or not. Because you're desensitized. I, um, one of my favorite characters in the Bible is John the Baptist. I, I don't really know why. Maybe it's because I'm John and I'm a Baptist. But um, I love John the Baptist. I've written lots of lessons on him, um, connecting everything with him. So, so I tell the story and I'm through. 
Um, let me tell you about John the Baptist. One of the first verses I've ever read is Luke chapter 1, verse 17. It says, John was strong in the sight of the Lord, drank me the wine, a strong drink. Nazarene vow. I, I read that right after I just got saved. I just got my first Bible. And so when I read that, I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be strong. I don't want to be mediocre. I want to be strong in the sight of the Lord. And, and so I knew I didn't want to mess with, you know, strong drink and all that stuff. So that was gone. Guess who loved to go hear John the Baptist preach? You, you know, don't you? Herod the king. The, the Bible makes this statement about him and gives no clarity. It says that John would go out into the Judean wilderness to preach, and Herod would come out there with his entourage. And the Bible says after he heard him preach, he would do many things. But it doesn't tell us what those many things are. But did you hear what John did? John shows up at the palace one day, and he says these words to Herod. Herod, the woman you're living with is not your wife. Matter of fact, it's your brother Philip's wife. You ought to give her back. You need to get right. Um, King didn't like that, so he threw him in prison. But then again, I I don't think that it bothered John a lot to be thrown in prison right away because, uh, do you know who his cousin is? (laughs) Yeah, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. So I I wonder if he didn't think, uh, he'll be here soon to rescue me. But days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and Jesus didn't come. A lot we don't understand because John was already in heaven when Jesus made this statement. Never was there a man born of woman greater than John the Baptist. John was already in heaven. Thought, why, why don't you live here? That? But anyway, he didn't. So um, throws him in prison. And then one night they throw a party. And remember the lady? Herodias? That's who he's with. Herodias. Philip's wife. Herodias has a daughter. Young. Uh, Herodias leaves the room. That's what the Bible says. And when she leaves the room, Herodias begins to dance. And uh, they were... Uh, drinking and partying and so Herod made a statement he said young girl I love the way you dance matter of fact ask of me anything up to half of the kingdom and I'll give it to you again sanctified imagination I'm getting ready to go to Israel for the 18th time and I would have said you know what I would like the Sea of Galilee (laughs) maybe the Golan Heights but she didn't know what to do, so read your Bible. She ran out of the room, found her mother, and said, Mom, it's a request bigger than I can answer. Uh, what should I ask him? And here's what she said. Ask for the head of John the Baptist on a silver charger. All right, now, I want my, my men friends to listen for just a moment. I, I don't know what you can do about this, but uh, there's not enough men that are leaders. There's too many followers. Somebody to really lead out and be God's man. And by the way, the world's dying for somebody to be different. Not, we're trying to fit in. Jesus needs somebody to stand out. And, and so listen to this. Listen to the words. When she asked for King Herod's head, the Bible says that Herod's heart was very sorrowful. Well, if his heart was sorrowful, he, said, he should have said, we're not going to do this. I'm king. I'm in charge. But instead, he said, having known that the others heard him, he felt compelled. Hmm. Peer pressure. You don't do what's right because everybody you hang around with is not doing right. And so you just acquiesce and go along with the crowd. And while you may know Jesus, and the crowd may not know, and so you just go ahead and lead them straight to hell. And I will tell you this, I'm reading through my Bible, I'm reading the chronological Bible study, I'm in Ezekiel right now, and if you haven't read Ezekiel 3, you ought to go back and refresh your memory. The Bible says if there are people on their way to hell and you're on your way to heaven and you don't blow the trumpet to warn them, he said they will go to hell, but I'll tell you, I will require their blood on your hands in heaven. Read your Bibles. And he said, now if you blow the trumpet and they perish, their blood will be upon their own heads. I'm telling you, God's called us to be responsible with the gospel and to make it known to people. Would you make this statement? Would you say that undoubtedly when Herod first got to hanging around John, his conscience was more sensitive than it was near the end? So maybe it went like this. Beep. Beep.
That is a dead conscience. A conscience that was sensitive. Respond to Jesus. And, and I want to just be honest. This is the majority of you in here tonight are church people. It's Sunday night. Come on. That means that somebody here doesn't need to be saved, but the majority of us know Jesus. I want to ask a question. I've been really concerned about Baptists lately. It's only the last question. Do you remember when we used to give invitations and people actually responded? I mean, I mean, got in the altars. The song, Come to the Altar, Gary, that was written from nine sermons I preached by Stephen Furtick. After he said he listened to my, my sermons, and God gave him that song, and he wrote it. Called me, said, it's coming out. Oh, come to the altar. And I thought, well, that's a good song to dedicate to Pastor Johnny if you want to, people ought to come to the altar. But I believe it used to be a time we were more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. God spoke more. Is, is God quit speaking in the 21st century? Or have we just moved into a time that we don't respond like we used to? Matter of fact, let me just ask you a question. Stay with me. I want to ask you a question. When's the last time the Holy Spirit spoke to you in a service and you publicly responded? And you sensed the need to go forward and say, Pastor, I've moved away from God in this area of my life. I want to rededicate my life. Can I tell you that I rededicate my life every now and to give a card to our counselors on Sunday while I'm handling the invitation? And I, let me tell you what I always do. I always specify why I'm coming. I never generally rededicate my life. It's not like I've, the wheels have come off in every area, but maybe I'd say my attitude's not been right. My thought life's not been right. And I'm coming today to surrender fresh and anew. When's the last time Jesus called you to a public response? Here's what people say. I'll tell you what, I don't know how you could be lost and set through a sermon like that. Well, hold on just a moment, partner. Lost people don't know God. So they, they don't have the Holy Spirit within. They don't know the Word of God like you do. And you're appalled that they're not responding. I've got a question. How about those of you that Jesus lives inside of you? You love the Word of God, and God speaks. What right do we have to talk about a lost man not responding when we can't even remember the last time we were open, honest, and obedient to the Holy Spirit? 